So <laughs> let's get started, everybody. So welcome again, if, or welcome if you're just joining us, to Clayton Library Presents, uh, our first presentation during Family History Month. Yay, October, we love October. And uh, today we have Peggy Price coming to us from the Texas State Library and Archives and talking about genealogy resources. I am Sue Kaufman, the manager of the Clayton Library, uh, which is part of Houston Public Library. And I'm very glad that you could join us. Um, we have a bunch of people visiting from all over, visiting for us. So thank you again for coming. Uh, I would like to, of course, I've already introduced myself, and I would be remiss if I did not introduce the team that helps put this together uh, here at the Clayton Library, Mitch and Joy, and through the Houston Public Library uh, programming, system-wide programming, Justin. These would not be happening if it wasn't for them. So thank you, colleagues. Uh, I'm reminding everybody to put the questions in the chat as we go through the presentation. And there is no handout for today, but there are full of information. And again, we are recording this presentation, so you'll be able to watch it just in case you are so entranced and you're just full of information and you need to go back and look at it. So before we get started, we have a little uh, things to announce. This is our upcoming programming. And you can see um, in October, we are chock full of presentations. Uh, we have a newspaper presentation coming up on the 13th. You can see a family history virtual showcase, all day webinars um, that are actually produced. So we're on a statewide program with the Waco Public Library, full day of webinars discovering your female ancestors, making sure we get everything, funeral records, organizing research, and then on into November. We do a lot of programming, find my past Native American history and then oral histories. You are more than welcome to join us and registration to these presentations happens exactly the way you did this presentation. I mean, or you registered for this presentation. So by all means, spend some time with us in October and uh, join us. We would love to have you. Of course, uh, we are open for research. We are open in, in person, uh, Tuesday through Saturday, 10 to four, or if you're not in the area or would just like to call us to get a, uh, bounce some ideas off of us, we are at 832-393-2600. Same hours, 10 to four, Tuesday through Saturday. And if you need a presentation for your group, by all means, call us. We can send you a list of our presentations. We are more than happy to do Zoom presentations for you or your group, making sure that we can share a bunch of knowledge that all of us have. So I am very pleased today to introduce Peggy Price from the Texas State Library and Archives, or TSLAC, as we affectionately call it. Peggy serves as the Education Outreach Coordinator for the Texas State Library. She offers informative presentations on the collections, the resources, and the services available through the Archives and Information Division of TSLAC. She holds degrees in library science, history, and English. Prior to her appointment at the library, at the Texas State Library, she worked in preservation, special collections, and reference services at academic libraries. And today she's uh, presenting an overview of essential resources for family history research available at the State Archives. Peggy, welcome, and we are thank very you. pleased to have you, and thank you for being one of us, the Special yeah. Collections Genealogist Archive Group. So. We're very glad to have you and I am going to stop sharing my screen and then um, you can go ahead and take it. And as I mentioned, questions in the chat. Thank you, Peggy, very much. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you for having me. I'm looking forward to sharing information about what we have at the Texas State Library and Archives Commission for your research. Um, my name is Peggy Price, and I'm the Education Outreach Coordinator for Archives and Information 
um, services at the Texas State Library and Archives Commission, quite the mouthful. Um, so today I'm gonna to give you an overview of the historical resources at the Texas State Library and Archives Commission that should be uh, particularly useful for genealogy research. But I wanna give you an overview and a background um, of how our agency came to be, where we are. And so you can explore, uh, show you how you can explore our, our resources from afar and then tell you how to um, get access to our collections. So before I get into all of that, let me get you oriented to where we are physically. Um, we are in downtown Austin. A lot of you are visiting virtually from all over the country. Um, so welcome to virtual Austin. The, uh, the Capitol complex is right in the middle of downtown. Here's a little map here. And we are um, just to the east of the Capitol. So there's that yellow star. And so if you want to come visit us in person, um, be sure and call and check and see how um, we are welcoming um, researchers at that time. It has been a moving target with, with COVID. Um, currently our archives research room is open. So just check with us before you make the trip. Um, so here we are um, downtown and there is a parking garage directly behind us, the Capitol Visitors Parking Garage, which conveniently offers free parking for the first couple of hours if there's no other events going on. Um, and then after that, it's pretty um, affordable. So just want you to know about that. And his, this is our website. All the things I'm talking about today, you can go and explore our website after. Um, the presentation. All right, so here's a little virtual visit into the lobby. We've entered uh, the front doors. The lobby is open for visitors, tourists, folks visiting the Capitol like to come in and look around and see what we have going on. So we have this lovely mural depicting the history of Texas right above our welcome desk. And we always have an exhibit on view. So this is what you would see if you were walking around our lobby. The exhibit that we have on view right now is called Cabinet of Curiosities. And it highlights the artifacts that we have in the state archives. All right, so that's a peek at the physical space and the agency itself is a lot bigger than just the state archives and so we have um, divisions that grew out of the Texas State Library and they address the needs of different user groups and if you are in Texas you may be um, interested in knowing just a little bit about these. Uh, so we have the talking book program that emerged from services for the blind that developed in the early 20th century and now offers audiobooks to all Texans who are not able to use the print books. Uh, the state and local records management division provides training and assistance to government entities who need to organize, retain, and store their records. And the Library Development Network supports the libraries and librarians of Texas with training, grants, and technology. And I am with the Archives and Information Services Division, and we collect, preserve, and provide access to the collections at the State Library and Archives. So the historical collections held by the Texas State Library and Archives Commission include the government records that were created by the officials serving the Republic of Texas and later state agencies. And also there are collections of papers from regular people, um, leading Texas families, organizations, businesses, and groups, and formats cover um, books, photographs, letters, artifacts, film, audio, and works of art. So I wanna give you a little historical background. We all love history, don't we? Where did we come from? How did we get this great repository here um, right in the Capitol Complex downtown Austin? Well, so from the earliest days of the Republic, there were leaders who advocated for and succeeded in obtaining support for a library and an archive of government records. Um, the two, the library and the archives were not always intertwined, um, but in the 20th century, they would be brought under the auspices of the Texas State Library and Archives Commission and moved into a new building. 
So generally speaking, we think of the library as containing the books or the publications and the archive as containing the government records or the documents. So we have here a look at an 1839 joint resolution from the Congress of the Texas Republic to appropriate $10,000 for the purchase of books for use by the government. And this was signed by Marabou Lamar, the president, and he considered himself to be kind of the man of letters and education, and he wanted to have a Library of Congress for our young country at the time. But over the years, this effort ebb and, ebbed and flowed, and it was not sustained with funding. Sounds like something that never changes, right? And uh, space or oversight um, was inconsistent. So I know this is difficult to read, so I'll just tell you it says, joint resolution making an appropriation for purchase of a library for the Republic of Texas, resolved by the Senate and House of Representatives of the Republic of Texas in Congress, assembled the sum of $10,000, be the same and is hereby appropriated for the purpose of purchasing a library for the use of the government of Texas. And that was January 1839. All right, so at the same time, that was the library, um, there, was a, there was also a need to maintain government records, the official um, documents of the government. So these archives became the subject of a struggle over the location of the capital of the Republic of Texas that took place between the first president of the Republic, Sam Houston, and his successor, Mirabeau Lamar who we just saw in the last document. So they both had these allied forces that wanted um, the capital to be in different places. Lamar selected Austin. Um, apparently he had visited the area on a buffalo hunt and he thought it was really nice and pretty and um, thought it'd be a great place for a capital. And then the Austinites thought that if the capital changed, um, they would have no livelihood because the government would be gone. So he had his defenders for, for Austin to be the capital. Then, but Sam Houston did not care for the city of Austin at all. And he wanted the capital to be in Houston. See, you could be in the capital of, of um, Texas right now had things gone in a different direction. Um, so he was elected president again, Sam Houston was, and um, he returned to office and this was his opportunity to move the capital. So, so he made an attempt to um, have, the, have the folks remove the archive of Texas to Houston in 1842. And they didn't. Um, so um, he took drastic measures and sent in the dark of night people to come to Austin and take the archives, which were stored in the general land office downtown, and load up all the papers on wagons and whisk them away. Well, unfortunately for him, Angelina Le um, Everly, who was a um, she owned it in there, she, she ran a boarding house and she saw what was going on. So she went out into the street, blew off a cannon that we kept there for protection and Austinites came out, they saw what was happening and they gave chase to, to um, these folks and captured them somewhere north of town up in Round Rock and brought the archives back to Austin. And that is now known as the Great Archives War, or the Texas Archives War, I'm sorry, of 1842. And we have a sculpture in downtown Austin at 6th and Congress of Miss Angelina Everly blowing off the cannon to, to save the archives. And uh, you can go and check that out if you're ever in downtown Austin. So eventually the government established a commission to oversee the collection and management of a state library along with a division to manage the state archives. And so in 1909, the state legislature created the Texas State Library and Archive, it's Texas State Library and Historical Commission, slightly different name. And then the archives division of the Texas State Library was housed in the basement of the Capitol. And the archives grew out of, uh, outgrew the space, which still happens to this day constantly. And um, so there were archives in, uh, in basements of other buildings, in a Quonset hut, in this cow barn. And so there was a need 
um, virtually from the beginning for its own building. So Governor Price Daniel advocated for a new building for the collections and the building was called the State Archives and Library Building. And the ribbon cutting was held in April of 1962. And so we'll be celebrating the anniversary of that, the opening of our building um, next year. All right, so that's the background of how we got here and um, little drama. Um, and then um, the nitty gritty, of course, that you all wanna know is what, what we have, what is in it. Well, lots of things. Uh, we have maps, we have books, we have documents, we have artifacts, we have flags, we have photographs. Um, this document here is a passport um, for the Republic of Texas. It's from for Anson Jones, the last president of the Republic of Texas. Uh, so this is what the passports back then look like. So we have a collection of those because we have papers um, from the Secretary of State's office. So government records can sound boring, but can actually be pretty interesting. And then so I'm going to talk about um, two general areas, our library collections and our archives collection, and then give you an overview of those and then give you a couple of specific examples from, from within those that should be particularly useful for genealogy. It is no, no way comprehensive to all our collections, but it just gives you a kind of close up look at the, of how, how our archives and um, library collections can be useful for genealogy research. <clears throat> So on the Texas State Library um, collections, and this grew out of that original 1909 agency, um, we have um, our publications, basically. That's just the easiest way to think of it. And these are all searchable in our online catalog, just like you would any other library catalog. So we have our government publications, and that means we have um, Texas state government publications, and we have US government publications. Um, we call those documents, but I can understand how that might be confusing between archival documents and government documents. Government documents are actually publications. Um, so we, we are a depository for Texas state um, government publications. So we're going to have reports and we're going to have um, publications from the university presence, for instance. So anything that state agencies are producing that are publishing that are part of this depository system, we will uh, preserve in our library. And it's the same with the U.S. government documents where they produce, they publish um, reports like this one that you see here on the federal response to Hurricane Katrina, um, we're going to have the, those kinds of federal documents in our collections. And then we have general books in, that are not government related, but related to Texas. Uh, so here you can see we have the first book that was used as a textbook to teach Texas history in schools, a, a new history of Texas by Anna J. Um, Pennebaker we have in our collections, um, there various books about the history of Texas, anything by Texans, just your general Texas history type books. And then we have our reference in genealogy, obviously of interest to you all today. Uh, the reference books um, are um, our city directories and our, our um, county records, or I'm sorry, our indexes to vital statistics, you know, any of these general reference books that we would have as a, you know, as these state library and archives are also very useful for genealogy. And then we have a genealogy collection where we have actually the kinds of books that you should be familiar with by now, where we, the family histories, the county histories, cemetery records, marriage records that folks have compiled, all of those kinds of things are in our genealogy collection and we have an extensive collection for Texas and then we have um, books from other states because obviously people come from other states um, to Texas so we have um, what we call our genealogy collection that you can search in our library catalog as well. And then we have databases, we have access to Ancestry and Fold3 um, and county records and newspapers. 
So my two examples I'm going to use today to talk about what um, might be helpful for genealogy research in the library collections are the vital statistics indexes and the city directories. And the vital statistics indexes are an important part of the research resources available at the library. And while we don't have access to the certificates themselves, the library does own selected indexes to Texas births, deaths, marriages, and divorces. If we peek inside one of them, just pull a, a, a particular year off the shelf, 1964, this is what it would look like for Collins. And then you can see a close up, it'll have the last name, the name of the child if there was a name, uh, the county and the date of birth and the certificate number. And now a lot of this information is now available in Ancestry and Family Search and that kind of thing. But if you want to go right to the source, right to the shelf and pick up uh, vital statistics index indexes, we do have those. And then we also have city directories, which are a great resource for genealogy. They're an important um, source of information about urban areas and their inhabitants. They provide personal and professional information about a city's residents, as well as information about its businesses, civic, social, religious, charitable, and literary institutions. They can include the name, address, and telephone number of the individuals. But they have so much more than a phone book. So this is the city of San Antonio. I believe we had at least one San Antonio visitor today um, from 1885-86. And the information that is available for the individual is pretty interesting. I've, I've pulled out Schrader here. So we have um, Charles, who was married to Emma Schrader and is a waiter at Looks Cafe at 90 and is a resides at 91 Red River. Uh, so you know where they work, their spouse, pretty interesting. Um, down here we have Bertha Schroeder, see also Schroeder. Uh, she's an operator with Southwestern Bell Telephone Company and she lives at 907 East 7th. So you can see how um, just taking any city over a period of time over decades, you can um, do a lot of historical research with these. I know when folks are looking at immigration patterns and things like that, you can look at the city directories and see what kind of businesses are developing um, when folks arrive and when they leave. So it's just a great resource that a lot of libraries have and, and, and we have here um, at the State Archives. And we do have a list of the city directories that we have on our website. So you'll know before you come if we have the, the city and year that you're looking for. But that's also something that our reference books would look up if it was just something like, I need to look at this city and this name. Can you check on that? That's something that that's just a quick look up they could do for you as well. All right, so that's the library side. And like I said, we have the library and the archive side. And then within each of those, I'm giving you a couple of, of examples. So when we get into the state archives, um, this is our, our government documents and our historical documents that are, are completely unique. Well, I say that, but generally speaking, these are the unique um, documents produced by government agencies and people um, in Texas. So I'm sorry, I lost my place. Um, so what I have here uh, just a few examples. We have the Declaration of Independence of Texas from Mexico. So that's one of our Texas treasures. We have the handwritten manuscript version. And then we have this broadside here um, that was produced to distribute at the time. And then we have that that passport I mentioned before from Anson Jones. And this is uh, in the middle here, the vote for annexation, annexation uh, to the United States when um, Texas went from being its own republic to a state. So what is all in the state archives? Here's a peek at the old school um, reading room, what it used to look like when we opened and what it looks like now. And so folks can come in and do uh, research with these unique items and it is very secure uh, where 
everyone's kind of lined up in front of the desk um, to make sure nothing gets damaged or stolen as they're doing their research. And we have the archival government records dating back to the 18th century. We do have original newspapers. I mentioned newspapers on the library side and those are, that's mainly microfilm. Well, we do have some original newspapers. Obviously it's very, they're very fragile and to de deteriorate very easily, but we do have some, if, if that's the only copy to look at. Uh, we have journals, manuscripts, photographs, maps, and all kinds of other historical resources. So a couple of examples of some government records that could be useful for genealogy. There's a lot of, of ways that you can use our collections for genealogy, but I'm gonna give you a couple of close-up looks. So the, the Department of Criminal Justice is state agency, but we, so it has its files going back, you know, decades to the last century as well. And so we have the Texas convict record ledgers and conduct registers. So when folks were incarcerated, they took down all kinds of information that now looking back um, can prove useful to find out more about your, you know, your criminal ancestors. <laughs> Uh, so this is what it looks like uh, in real life. The, there are large volumes, handwritten information along certain data fields. We have age, height, weight, um, complexion, eye color, hair color, any identifying information. Um, and then even their habits, do, do they smoke, do they drink? What's their educational um, background? date of birth, and that kind of thing. And so here's an even closer look. You can see for every person, they're gonna document all that kind of information every time somebody comes in. And we do have kind of an infamous um, person here in our records named Clyde Barrow. And if that doesn't immediately ring a bell, if you think Bonnie and Clyde, that's who this person is. Mr. Clyde Barrow, alias Alvin, Alvin Williams. Elvin Williams, sorry. Um, he was 18, uh, five foot five and a half, weighed 120, 127 pounds, he weighed less than me. Um, so he's uh, got a size six shoe. He was married. Um, he was temperate, so not a drinker. So you can find all this about, all this about people um, that you're researching. Um, and, and, you know, I mean, the fact that they were incarcerated no judgment, right? So um, here are the data fields spelled out a little bit easier to read. You can see occupation, um, their residence, money, terms of imprisonment, all kinds of um, in-depth information. And then um, another example are our com Confederate pension applications. Um, after the demise of the Confederacy, many Texans who fought in the war needed assistance and those who had fought and left behind widows also requested pensions from the government. So when you're requesting these pensions, they filled out a form and answered a lot of questions. Uh, these records provide detailed documentation of Confederate veterans or their widows who sought or received pensions from the state of Texas between 1899 and 1975. I know we think of the Civil War as a long time ago, but um, this is well into the 20th century that we have these do this documentation. Um, so let's take a look. This is what the originals look like. So here's an application of veteran soldier of the late Confederacy for pension under the act of May 12, 1899. Uh, so that's what just your typical pension application looks like. And here is the form filled out by a widow and let me get you a close up so you can see the kind of information you can learn about these individuals. Uh, the physical condition question was important because they had to be feeble. They had to really need the, the um, pension um, and not really able to get it other ways, I assume. So, um, but it also talks about the date of the husband's death. Um, the state where your husband's command originally uh, originated, um, where they resided, for how long, um, and all of these kind of details. 
that can help you learn more about these individuals. And it's not just this form, it's, uh, it can be a whole packet of documentation where they're including all kinds of, you know, letters and things to prove who they were related to and why they need this, this pension. So it can be just be a whole, you know, mini documentary of these people in, in these packets. So I talked about the, the library collections and then gave you a peek into vital statistics indexes and city directories and then went over to the state archives and looked closer at the um, convict ledgers and Confederate pension applications. Um, and we could go on and on and on, but I just wanted to, to highlight those um, a, a couple of particular things. Um, but how do you find these materials um, from afar? Well, we do have, uh, first, let me point out this URL here. You can go to that URL and, and explore all of these things. We have a library catalog online. Uh, so you can do your searching and limit it to genealogy collection and see all of those kinds of publications, um, you know, see their records. I don't mean that the publications are there. And then we have um, our finding aid list and a finding aid search. So when we have archives, they don't get necessarily cataloged like a book publication, but we do create a finding aid that details the kinds of things that are in the collection and you can search those, those lists. Um, so those are the archival collections. And then the Texas Digital Archive, it's its own archive of um, our digitized versions of a lot of these materials. And um, that's growing all the time. And you can explore that to see written photographs and even born digital materials and um, a, a, just a lot of our interesting materials online. And then we have collections online that are not in our Texas Digital Archive, but still um, you're able to look at the digital versions online, like we have a map collection, for instance. So you can pull up all kinds of um, maps doing searches. You can search our um, like fire insurance maps and those kinds of things. We have a whole collection of claims that were made during the Republic era. If anyone did any business with the Republic government, they could file a claim and then all of that information is documented and that has been digitized and you can search those. So you could spend a lot of time on our website looking at actual digitized versions of primary sources. And then we have our exhibits online, which um, if we have an exhibit in the lobby, we do create a, vir a virtual version of it. And then there are also virtual exhibits that um, were created just for the internet, just for to be online. So if you come in and visit, this is the, um, the scene. We have our archives reading room that you saw earlier. And those are these folks here. And then our library reference reading room here. Our reference staff are available um, Th throughout the week on the phone, on through email. So you can always check with them to see if, if we have what you need before you come in. And if you're going to do extensive research, it's always helpful to go ahead and, and talk to them first or email them first, and then we can have things pulled for you when you come in. And this is what you would experience if you came in. We, we do have a secure building downtown. So, I mean, our visitors do need to register at our welcome desk and get a visitor's badge. And we have lockers for your personal belongings while you do your research. And there are um, registration levels. If you're going to do um, in-depth research in our archives, you're gonna to need to fill out a registration form and all of that kind of thing. But all of this information is available in our before you visit page on our website. And I want to bring your attention to some research webinars that we're doing. Um, every month we highlight a different collection or type and um, one of our reference staff does an overview of say Texas state documents or photograph collections or 
things that I've mentioned here that you want to know more about, if you go to this to, to our website, you can watch the recordings of all of those. And they're screencasts where it's just meant to give you like 15 minute, 20 minute overview of one of our um, resources. You can also keep up with what we're doing here through a mailing list. We have so if you sign up there, you'll get our emails about events like those research webinars and other things. We have a blog out of the stacks uh, where we keep um, uh, we update folks on collections that are now available online or different different focus like Hispanic um, Heritage Month, that kind of thing. And we also have a conservation blog where our conservator writes about different um, projects that she's working on. And then we are also on all of the social media channels. Well, not all, I don't think we're TikToking yet, but we have your standard issue, Facebook posts, Twitter, Instagram. We also have a YouTube channel with, with our videos of our webinars and that. So um, please like us and follow us to keep up with, with the happenings here at TSLAC. And um, before I close and open up for questions, I do want to mentioned that we have an outpost. We have a site in your area, in the Houston area, sort of, um, in Liberty, the Sam Houston Research Library and Research Center. They have a great little museum. They have um, archival collections, manuscript collections documenting the 10 county area out there and uh, library collection and um, Folks are doing genealogy research out there as well. So not, so note that contact information and um, their website or webpage and remember that they're, um, they're available too. So thank you for your attention while I, I went through all of that and I'm happy to take some questions if you have them. Thanks. Well, Peggy, thank you. Thank you. And I think that all of us are very interested in learning about another repository where we can find stuff. And so we appreciate you. We appreciate you sharing that. I think one of the uh, one of the interesting things that you mentioned was is government records can sound boring, but are pretty interesting, you know. And so that's that's exciting too to think about. Um, some of the more unusual sources, you mentioned the map and the city directories and like, of course, the prison records, but um, discovering new resources is always exciting for somebody searching their family, right? So, so. Yeah, go ahead. Is there, is, there, is there one of your, you know, when you do the presentation, do you have one or two record sources that are kind of really cool that are kind of your favorites do you can you think of any of those not to put you on the spot but <laughs> well uh i i mean i i'm going to tell you the first thing that comes to my mind because uh i was just working on our exhibit on artifacts and we have we just have some kooky artifacts that we've acquired in various for various reasons, but um, so we have so we have a necklace made out of hair, which apparently hair jewelry was a thing in the 19th century. Uh, not I mean maybe not a lot of research value, but just a curious item. Um, we also have the a box called the Ark of the Covenant that was created from wood from the original um, Republic of Texas Capitol where well where no I'm sorry where the Declaration of Independence was signed wood came from that structure to create this Ark of the Covenant so it just seems so perfect for this you know enormous archive with their with our voluminous stacks and everything to have this big box for called the Ark of the Covenant. So those are a couple of things that come to mind right away. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and, and what you mentioned, you know, uh, brings up a very good point that although the building might be full of records, you know, paper, okay, but history also comes in all kinds of forms. So ephemera and other things like that, hence the displays and things like, you know, that you're showing. So, and there's a story behind those too, you know, um, right. you know, uh, I, before we get to the questions that Mitch is going to go through, uh, Catherine asked me a question, uh, 
uh, separately. Um, we, we she asked about similar presentations from other state archives. Catherine, you meant you read our mind. Um, we are creating sort of a series, if you will, about state archives. We have the Illinois State Archives in uh, January, and then we're looking at some other state archives. So we are trying to share resources that people can go to that are full of information and are full of things like Peggy has uh, expressed here. So um, Mitch, what kind of questions do we have in the chat? Well, we do have a, a couple of questions. I'd just like to say I've always wondered where the Ark of the Covenant ended up, and now we know. Um, so I have a question here from Andrea that uh, Andrea asked, does the, does the State Library and Archives house slave records for the state? Uh, yes, you can do, you can do research on on that, and I'm going to have to direct you to our reference staff. Um, and I'm by direct you, I mean, uh, they're at ref at tsl.texas.edu um, to see the form that those take. Um, but I know that you can do that kind of research in our collections. Would you be able to put that into the uh, the chat, maybe before before you go? Yes. Okay. Let me do Thank it right you. now. Uh, so well, it's on, the, it's on the screen. <laughs> it's on the screen. Okay. Oh, there is. Okay. Okay. Um, so we have a question from Natalie that asks, is there a list of newspapers online that you have at, at the library? Yes. Um, on our website under um, archives and reference, there is a link to genealogy collection or genealogy research. Mm -hmm. And if you follow that, I, I will put that in the chat. So genealogy um, on our arc and, uh, and you can look at pull up a list of that. Okay, okay, great. Yes, yeah, so so you'll know what we have and, and it'll it'll specify whether it's original or mm -hmm. if it's microfilm. So it, yeah, and I don't know if I mentioned that those are the microfilm are available for interlibrary loan. So if you needed to go through your oh. Houston library to or your other Texas library to get them, you could. That's good to know. Yeah. So John uh, is asking, what's the difference between the archive holdings in Austin and those of its branches, for example, in uh, Liberty? In Liberty. Oh, OK. Yeah. So we're going to be the primary um, holding site for state government records. But there are things called RHRDs um, that were for records for those particular areas have a, a, an, uh, an archive in that area to just make it more accessible to people. So the records that are available in Liberty are going to be for the counties in that immediate area. And mm -hmm. so if we needed them um, in Austin, for some reason, we would pull them here. But that's that's their primary collecting area and and that's what they have so well, well bill and you can a, look at what they mm -hmm. have okay i was say bill has a follow-up question uh, asking are there additional branches or affiliate affiliated libraries around texas other than the sam houston liberty site for the texas state library and archives commission uh no that that is kind of a um, hard thing to answer though, because I mean, we, but I, I'll say no, but we do our library development network um, division. It's a different division, but they do support libraries around the state. And so there are a lot of grant opportunities, training, professional development, um, databases um, like the TechShare database consortium, things like that, that our agency supports. But as far as just having a, another site, um, well, now I'm gonna have to stop and say, um, <laughs> we have our, um, our record center as well. We do have a site for our record center. As, but as far as what I think you're asking is, you know, as far as you know, archival um, access and things like that, um, it's Austin and Liberty. Okay, okay. Uh, Natalie has... Um, um, Go ahead. 
Yes, and um, if you are looking at our online catalog, then it will specify where that book is located, if it's in Liberty or if it's in, in Austin. Right, I, I see the, the notice from Natalie saying that, uh, that she had gone to Austin to look at a book and it turned out it was in Liberty. So yeah, mm -hmm. it's a good idea to check before you go. Um, and speaking of that, she has a question that do you have county records that are not available at county courthouses or are your records the more state related? We do have county records and county records on microfilm. Now, I, I mean, I do believe these are going to be du duplicated from counties themselves. However, if that county for some reason doesn't have them, you know, we might have them. But, you know, originally, I believe they were acquired from county records, from the counties. So the duplication question, I'm a little iffy on, but we do have county records, but they are mainly on microfilm. And there is a research webinar on that as well with more details. And you can check our website for the, for, you know, the counties where we have county records. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, let me see. Okay, well, Shelly has a question here. It's, it's kind of an open question, but I'll, I'll go ahead and, and toss it to you. Uh, do we really need to buy the information from the genealogy companies to find information on our ancestors, or can we get it from your library? I think the uh, I think that the companies would say they bring added value because they put them all in one place and make them searchable and that kind of thing. However, um, I do want to let everyone know that there are um, there are digitized versions of our records of Texas state records that we have partnered with Ancestry and they are uploaded to Ancestry and they are freely available to Texans. Um, just put in your zip code and you, you can freely access all of these, um, the criminal um, justice records that I mentioned earlier, Confederate pensions, and those kinds of records can be searchable in Ancestry. So sometimes they do, um, you know, offer partnerships like that, um, but, you know, you're your, your question is true. We do, we do provide the information that ends up in these places, but um, mm -hmm. you're, you're welcome to research as, as you see fit. <laughs> but, but the state's taking the steps to make sure that, that all these public records are freely available to citizens mm -hmm. of the state. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. Good. That's great. And, yes. And as Shelly says, family search is free. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. Uh, that's all the questions. I, that's all the questions I have here in the, uh, in the chat. So I'll turn it back over to Sue. Thank you, Peggy. Thank you. Thank you, Mitch. Thank you, Mitch. And thank you, Peggy. Um, I believe that through, and I was just trying to check, but you threw it back to me too quickly, Mitch. I believe that um, on the Houston Public Library website, through our research, there is a section for the Texas records that are available through Ancestry that you can use without a subscription to Ancestry. Uh, since I don't do Texas research as Mitch, is that correct? Um, I'm Actually, just I think that is right, yes. Yes, yes. So uh, I understand that there are a number of people that are not in Texas here through our webinar, but if you do live in Texas, you can get a Houston Public Library card at houstonlibrary.org. It's called Get a My Link Card. So you can uh, engage those uh, databases through our library. It, uh, just uh, Joy just put that in the chat. Um, so you can engage some of the Texas uh, sources that are in our on ancestry. But again, going to a place, there's plenty of stuff that is not digitized. Right. You know, yeah. And so calling reference, you know, at the Texas State Library to see if there's anything there. The supplemental material that um, you know very well might be supplemental to the digitized material. And as Natalie mentioned earlier, you know, calling either us, calling the Texas State Library, wherever you're going to go, calling before you go is one of the smartest things that you can do, especially when it comes to archives, because there's stuff that they might know in libraries that we might know that is supplemental to your research that we can pull or get together before you come. 
So calling first or emailing is one of your best uh, suggestions, Peggy? Yes, uh, yes. I mean, just especially in these times um, where, where um, patterns can vary from library to library as far as accessibility. But, um, but yes, I only scratched the surface as far as the types of collections that we have that could be useful for genealogy. So, um, so I do hope you'll explore the website mm -hmm. and, and contact our reference folks who are just, um, they're, they, they're standing there waiting for you to contact them to um, direct them in, in the right direction. So. Correct, correct. And as Peggy mentioned, going through the website, so you're familiar with, you know, number one calling, but maybe some of the nuances of going to visit an archive, like you mentioned, you know, registering if you're going into the archive. So wherever you're going, always, um, always uh, call first. And um, let's see, Jack asked a question just before we go. Do we have access to Ancestry through the library to see those records or can we see them from a personal Ancestry membership also? If you have a personal membership uh, Ancestry, what you can do into Ancestry is, is there's a link when you click on the word search, there is a link there that says uh, card catalog and you can put in Texas. They are part of the larger component, but Ancestry has pulled out those Texas things. Is that correct, Peggy? To give people in Texas access. That's we have yeah, we have a whole step-by-step -step instructions on our website how to do do it from our website. I wasn't sure if Jack was asking about T Slack or your Houston um, mm. webpage, but at T Slack um, we do have we have instructions on how to do it. And it, you basically you'll put in your zip code and it'll take you it'll take you there. So instead so, of starting at Ancestry, you can start at our webpage. And that's that great. Way. That's great. So, so that answers that answers for the out of state people who you know would need to pay for a Houston card to see those Texas resources. Just go to the text to the T Slack page, and look at those Ancestry Texas links. Correct. Well, they would need to put in a Texas zip code, which a I would. Just, mm -hmm. <laughs> the Texas zip code. So okay, all right. So. There is, um, if you go to, if you're talking about going through the Houston Public Library website, you'll go to houstonlibrary.org. Uh, you'll get the My Link card, and then um, you will go ahead and get, uh, go to research, go to genealogy, and then you can access the Texas link through there, through the Texas State Library website. They're also there also, correct? All right, everyone. So please enjoy and our next presentation. Joy, can you uh, announce what our next presentation is since we don't have the, I don't have the slide up. Would you like to do that? Uh, sorry Sue, I'm pause. sorry, I don't have that up either, but I know it's by Irene Walters and she'll be talking okay. about obituaries on October 13th at 2 p.m. Central great. time. <laughs> there we go. No, 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 no. And I, I and I knew I put you on the spot. But the next presentation is the 13th, which is next Wednesday. That's great. And so we hope to see everyone there. And as you did for this one, please visit our website to register. We would love to have you. Peggy, thank you again very much for your time. And go forth and research, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Thank you all. Thank you.